Hey guys, welcome to another episode with Melinda Livesey. If you haven't been here before, you definitely need to know about Melinda. There's a bunch of episodes that we'll link to somewhere. I'm not giving a point because I always point in the wrong direction. Check those episodes out. But Melinda, give us a quick update. Who are you? What's going on? And I'm glad to be talking to you again. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me back. Uh, Wow, an update. It's been a little bit since I've been back on the show. Mm -hmm. Uh, I first was on last year. I was a very confused designer. I would classify myself as a graphic designer at that time. Uh, Since then, I learned brand strategy. And I've been focusing more on offering brand strategy, identity, and messaging since then. That's a few things I had never offered before. So my business has radically changed. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it. Uh, I had to get rid of some lower paying clients that I was more of an order taker with okay. and then coming in more as an expert. Mm. So people actually hire me for my expertise. So fantastic. There's a lot of people who are going to want to know how you transition from being a graphic designer to more of a brand strategist, but that's not this episode. That's not this episode. This was just a quick recap. If you're curious, like I said, again, go check out the video. I might have screwed that up. It's probably on the other side. Whatever side I point to, I know it's on the other side. Anyways, let's get into it. It's been a little while. What is on your mind? What are we going to talk about today? I would love to talk about specializing Mm -hmm. versus being a consultant who can solve any problem for a client. Because those two things seem completely different, but I I hear you talk about both of those things a lot, but I don't know how they live together. Okay, can you give me a real world example where those two are in conflict with each other? When we had chatted, I think it was last year, and you were coaching me on how to go through the initial call with a client, you had me ask the client why they're looking for that project and uncovering the why of of what's propelling them into this certain deliverable or the initiative. Right. And so to me, I see that more as a consultant coming in trying to solve whatever problem it is that the client's looking for. Whereas specializing, if you specialize in something, say you're a type designer, or you do something really well, illustration, um, a specific type of design, to me, a client's gonna come to you for that specific type of deliverable. Mm-hmm. So then I don't see how those two things could live. So I don't, I don't have a specific example of someone coming to me for the deliverable. <laughs> But it's also me, you know, trying to figure out how do those two things live? Because I have a lot of people that have asked me as well, well, should I specialize? But then how do I solve my client's problem as well if I'm, if I offer a specific So you're asking for other people? As well as myself. But it's not really for you. No, it's for me. Because you're doing just fine. It's for me too. Well, I'd like to know specifically for you so I can solve your problem. So we're not talking about somebody that's not in the room. Is that possible? Yes, it's possible. Okay, let's do that. So you're making this transition from being a graphic designer. Essentially, you design identity systems, right? A logo, letterhead, packaging, collateral, all that kind of stuff. Maybe even some web design. But now you've I don't go that far. You don't go that far. I don't go that far anymore. The The old old you. you. The old you. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The old you did that. And now you've pivoted. And now you're in the brand strategy space. So we don't even know, I guess, for everybody that's tuning in. What does that even mean, you're a brand strategist? So I help a brand or business develop their personality, which that would include knowing who they are and developing that personality so that it will be attractive to their ideal client. And then Mm -hmm. also uncovering who that your ideal client is and how to communicate what they need to to the ideal client. Okay. So that is essentially the true definition of branding, right? Right. Okay. So a lot of people are going to be watching this and they're going to be asking themselves, wait, I I do that. So talk to the old you who didn't know this and speak to to that and let them know what the differences are. So a big difference was I switched from a questionnaire to a strategy workshop. So something where I sit down with the the founder, the key stakeholders in the business to uncover the things about the brand that makes them unique. And so that's different than before. The old me would just give a questionnaire and almost ask the client, what exactly are they looking for versus me going in and meeting with them um, face to face and then uncovering those insights that maybe they don't see on the surface. Mm. So that's one big difference. 
Can you give us an example of some of the questions that you used to ask on a questionnaire? I would ask very similar ones that I do now. Um, mm -hmm. Things like, who's your target audience? What, this is not like I do now, but um, what type of brand do you want to be like? What type of brands do you relate to that you would want to fall into that category as far as aesthetics are concerned? Mm -hmm. um, what's the backstory okay. of your business? Where'd Perfect. you come up with your name? So Melinda, so what you're saying right now is as a brand strategist is you're able to connect dots with the client that a questionnaire could not serve. Correct. Right. Okay. Correct. And why do you think that is? A couple of things. When I was giving a questionnaire, it was like homework for a client. And I, I know for myself, when I've had questionnaires like that, when I've hired, because I've hired a copywriter before for my own website um, and other, other people that had questionnaires, it was a daunting task. And it's something that if you're just there filling out the answers by yourself, you're only gonna give what's on top of your head and get really exhausted really fast. And so there's only so many things that you can, can give at that moment. Whereas if someone was asking me those questions, it'd be a lot easier to make connections and start thinking of stories and um, it would, it would ignite that part of my brain, whereas I can't really do that on my own. And I think that's what was happening with clients. And so who advised you not to stop doing the questionnaire? <laughs> that's an obvious, obvious answer, Chris. <laughs> that would be you. Okay, okay. I want to point it out to everybody that's watching because I used to do the same. Early on in my career, I put out a questionnaire too. I just stopped doing it because the answers I was getting were obviously not well thought out. Let me, let me go over a couple of points just to drive this issue home for everybody that's watching. If you're guilty or still practicing of doing questionnaires, let me just tell you why you probably should change your mind about this. One is, I just hired you and now you gave me more work to do. I don't want to feel like you're doing the work with me, that it's just not pushing the responsibility on me. And you're 100% right. We look at the questionnaire as a chore. We want to get it done quickly so we can move on with our life. If you guys are one of those strange individuals where you get a survey in the mail and you're like, yes, can't wait to do it. I love this. You know, so very few people are going to put the time and energy into answering the questions the way that you want. Now, here's the other problem is when I fill out a questionnaire, I'm pretty much taking your order. You know, what would you like to order today for the appetizer? You want to start with the soup and you just go down the list and it's like, okay, I'll be right back with your meal. And that removes you as a participant in the conversation and really defines you as the order taker. Literally, here are the questions. I don't really want to talk to you. Fill it out good or bad, I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to make you what it is that you asked for. So what happens is this is the power of conversation. You're building rapport. You're trying to get inside the person's head. So on first glance, if you ask them, what do you, what do you want your brand to be about? And they're like, yeah, I want it to be optimistic, innovative, and cool. Well, if that were written in the questionnaire, you'd walk away optimistic, innovative, and cool. And that could mean a lot of different things. So those are very broad words. And you have to remember the client doesn't have the same design training as you. They don't have the visual vocabulary to describe what it is that they want. If they did, they would hire a low-level designer and just give them the work and art direct them. So you definitely want to be a part of the conversation. This is super, super important. I want to just make sure you guys totally understand this. So even though Melinda theoretically is asking the same types of questions, She's getting different answers because she's shaping the conversation. She's going into it and saying, why do you say that? Can you give me an example of that? Oh, maybe the word that you're looking for isn't cool. It's more conservative. Like, yes, you're right. So this is where you're starting to build rapport with them. And they're starting to feel like, gosh, this person in front of me really understands me. And they care. And they're able to get something out from me that I didn't even know that I wanted. And that's the beginning of your transition from being a designer or an identity designer to a strategist. Okay, let's get back into it then. So now that we know, and thanks for clearing that up, give me an example where somebody's coming to you and asking you for a very specific deliverable and how you've uh, reframed the conversation so that you're like saying to them, that's fantastic, we'll make that. But let me ask you about your motivations, your why, why are we here? Why are we talking about this in the first place? Where's the pushback been in terms of you positioning yourself as a specialist versus a strategist? Surprisingly, there hasn't been as much pushback 
Yes. Since I have positioned myself as a strategist. Mm. So I haven't run into as many. Now, there's been a couple that have come to me for the deliverables. Um, and I have been successful at pivoting the conversation. Mm-hmm. It ended up that some of those clients just uh, budget wise, it wasn't a good fit. Right. But they understood. And the thing that was really interesting, um, like they didn't they didn't keep pushing me towards that direction. But once they heard, oh, you do brand strategy. And um, when I was asking them those questions, like, what's the reason for this? Um, you know, why now? Why right. are you? Why are you doing this now? Why? Uh, why is? Why are you not just redoing your website? Why are you needing to redo the whole brand? And so asking those questions, and then once it got to the point of talking about brand strategy, and they realized, oh, this is a much bigger deal than I had thought. Right. Then they said, well, let me go back to the table and, and relook at budgets or let me mm. rethink this whole thing. So I so I was successful at pivoting the conversation, um, but those clients I've noticed don't come in with the budget if they yeah. come in asking for just that deliverable. Okay, I have many questions for you. Many, many questions, and I wanna point something out that you just helped me to realize right now. I'm reading Russell Brunson's book, Dot Com Secrets, and the thing that we realize is that we assume everybody that comes to us, that comes knocking, is a hot lead. And then we start acting like, okay, let's get into it. Let's just sell the thing. Let's close the deal. Let's move on with our lives. When in fact, even though they're calling you, even though they're reaching out via email, it's actually a colder lead than you think because they're not even aware of the problem. We need to make them aware of the problem. So they're acting on what they believe to be the symptoms. So they're saying, oh, this isn't working. So therefore, I'm going to self-diagnose. I'm going to prescribe this solution. They come to a designer and said, hey, it looks like you do this. Why don't you do this for me? And most people accept that at face value and do that, and that's fine. Many people now, hopefully having watched this show and have absorbed the content, take a moment to say, "Let's, let's take a pause here and let's try to understand what the problem is. And what they realize, it's something much deeper than that. So we're treating the symptoms. Let's say, like, let me make an analogy real quick. Let's say you have a rash or some kind of dry spot on your skin and you just kind of, you come to the pharmacy and you're like, give me an ointment, just give me a cream or a lotion, I'll put it on it. And you, you do it and it makes the, the itch tolerable. But it never really solves the problem. When in fact, had you gone to a doctor, they might have tested you and found out you have an allergy to carrots or something like that. So you cut carrots out of your diet, now your skin looks better and you're healthy, you have more energy. And by the way, that little dry spot has cleared up. So that's what we're talking about here. Okay, I hope people understand that. So the question I have for you is this. There is fear in most designers in making that transition from being a specialist designer towards becoming a strategist. And we fear all these kinds of things. Like, what if they ask me all these kinds of questions? What if they say, what proof do you have? And what kind of guarantees can you make? These are fears, these fantasized experiences appearing real that we have, this dialogue, this negative self-talk that we have that keeps playing But somehow, when you find the courage to act, as which you have been able to do, you realize, oh my gosh, the pushback isn't even there. And people get it. But it could just be that you're a really gifted communicator. So share with us a little bit of how those conversations go. Well, even before I get to the conversation part, I do Mm want to make note of something that you said, because it I think it's very important to note it before you even get into conversations mm-hmm. is that you had said not all leads that come in are hot that a lot of them are cold okay so before when i first came on the show with you and yeah, i was starting yeah. to talk to you i was in that mindset of every single lead mm-hmm. that comes to me <laughs> is so burning hot it is right. really really hot and i better like lava that hot thing. lava yeah. hot then as I positioned myself as a strategist where people actually understood what it was that I was doing, they mm-hmm. understood the outcomes that potentially could happen for them or they've seen it for others, that once I started that, I can tell the difference now between someone who's super cold, like the, hey, how much would you charge for a logo when they're DMing me right. on Instagram versus... Um, Someone who comes and says, hey, I heard that this is what you did for this other company. I'm having a similar problem. Can we talk? Yeah. So there's a, it's a stark difference. And I did not see that before. That is a big, big difference between even this time last year, Mm -hmm. me this time last year and now. Look at you. There's a big, whoa, whoa, there's a difference in leads. Not every lead is created the same. (laughs) You're growing up right now. It's fantastic. (laughs) Right before your eyes. Awesome. I love it. You look the same, but you're all grown up. (laughs) 
So there is that. So then once you get to the conversation, it's been so much easier for me, so much easier where I'm not having to pivot as much the conversation. I will ask the, let's say the founder, can you tell me about your vision? Just, just tell me about your vision about what you see for your business in the next few years or what you're hoping to do. And one time I was on a call, he goes on for 20 minutes, very excited about his Um, about his vision, about his business, what he wants it to do, where he wants to go, that by the end of it, I had said nothing except maybe mirroring back what he had said. And then he goes, I feel really good about this. Let's do it. And they did. And I didn't, I just asked the question, Mm -hmm. what are you hoping to do? What is your vision? Because I could tell that he was, he wasn't necessarily having a problem. He just had a big goal. Right. So that's what we focused on. And then by the time we ended the call, he convinced himself into it. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't selling. I've realized it's not about convincing. It's not about persuading that when it's the right fit, you're smiling because you know. You're, oh, you're I'm like, listening. I'm, so I, I'm just thinking, <laughs> well done. Well done. That it really didn't feel like selling. It was not yes. selling. It was a conversation. And then I we realized, both of us, that it was a good fit. And then we moved forward. Fantastic. So if if I were a martial arts instructor, if I was your Shifu, and you and I were talking, and we we're doing a test, I think you just graduated from whatever belt you wore. And I'm visualizing <laughs> in my mind, the reason why I'm smiling is like, I'm putting that new belt on you right now. It's like, you've earned this. Thank you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Melinda Sound, you've earned this. <laughs> okay, very good, very good. Okay, wow. What a what a radical transformation. Well, let's keep going here. The reason why you asked this question about generalist versus a specialist is you've not hit that wall. You haven't hit that resistance. So what is motivating you to ask this question? I'm curious. Well, I consider myself specializing in branding, specifically okay. brand strategy, identity, messaging. I mm. personally don't want to go past that. I, I don't want to do the collateral. I don't want to do the websites. I see people who do websites as specialists that hopefully they specialize in that. Mm-hmm. And I don't necessarily want to do the whole gamut. So I'm trying to see, well, how, f- where can I draw the line and okay. still be profitable and still grow? And so far yes. it's been fine, but I'm sure that there's... I don't know. Is there a line somewhere? So we're talking about right now you offer logo, identity, and messaging as part of the deliverables of the strategy. Uh, no, it's separate now. So No, no, I mean like as the deliverables, meaning like you do oh. strategy first. Right. And these are the things you actually make. And anything else that falls outside of that, you'll refer somebody else. Right. Okay. Okay. That's, that's very good. So even in your broad generalist strategy, strategist mode... You, you actually are very hyper-focused. Right. Okay. That makes a lot of sense to me. Now, is, is your question, uh, should I open it up? Am I thinking short-sighted, Chris? What, what is the question here then? I guess where to go from here because okay. I, have, I have that specialty. I have what I want to do. Now I'm thinking, well, then do I, I don't know, do I grow as far as I don't really want to manage people. I don't want to have a big team. Mm. But then do I just establish myself as the expert and start putting out more thought pieces? Do I specialize in that sense? Like getting known for maybe even something within the brand strategy branding realm. Mm -hmm. Because I was watching also Fabian who is on your show and he's he has his particular niche as well in the branding space. And you guys have met each other in real life, right? We have. Yeah. Okay. And have you shared information and learned from each other? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So it seems like you're attracted to his style of business, which is run really lean and light Mm -hmm. and have a lot of flexibility and freedom. Is that why you don't want to grow in terms of having more people? Yeah. And is there a bad experience in your past where you did that and it just tainted the whole idea in your mind? As far as growing? As far as hiring people and then it's just like, oh, God, that sucked. That's stressful. I don't want to do that anymore. Uh, not an absolutely horrible experience, but I've never really liked it. I like collaborating with other agencies. 
mm-hmm. in that respect, but I don't necessarily like hiring hired hands who just put out the work. I don't like the management of it. I just... Which part bothers you? What part do you struggle with? Because uh, as an entrepreneur, I think I think we need to learn to scale. We need to scale, and the only way we, we can do that is if we can offload and basically sell some of our time or buy time, something like that. Right now you're selling time. You're not buying any time, right? Well, that's... that, And that's where I think my, my thinking gets halted because yes yeah. scaling I do see that yeah but then the other there is scaling as far as being an expert and just getting paid more and more and more for your expertise right so there's that scaling I would like to go that way rather than people scaling okay you want to be able to charge more for your work basically you want to sell at a higher price to more clients and do less that's the sell, ultimate sell goal. at a higher pl- price but keep Clients at a low. I don't want a ton of clients. You said oh. more clients. Okay. So you just want to sell. Okay. I see. So I think you want a lifestyle business. Is that okay? What does that mean? That means that you're comfortable working and making a certain amount of money and you're not really going to be a world beater. You're not going to look at changing and revolutionizing everything. No, like, we just had Seth Godin on and he's a what? A one man team. I know he doesn't do, I realize that he's not in the same space as us, but why couldn't I be the Seth Godin of, why can't I not be be, the Chris Dell? But I don't know if you listen to his story, he he sold one of his companies for $30 million. Okay. So he can do whatever he wants. But does that, well then we get into... Like he he went through that arc early in his career and he actually was part of, I think some pretty major disruptions and innovations like uh, corporate email there's a couple of things that he innovated so that was in the early part of his career so if you want to jump to the latter part of his career and i'm going to assume this and i'm not saying that he's getting old because he's not but he's moving into that you know how he talked about on the edge the early adopters and he's moving towards the middle now like apple we have to do what apple did before we can be in the middle part of apple because otherwise we're just moving into retirement but you can have a beautiful lifestyle business where you can only work four months out of the year and make a certain amount of money and have only a handful of clients and be totally content with that and i think that's a great model if that's the model you want i just think we need to be cognizant of the decisions we're making today and what the pros and cons are for tomorrow so let's let's put this into perspective I know it's hard to tell, but I'm an old dude. I know it's not that hard to tell. I am an old guy, okay? I'm 46 years old, so I'm going to be 50 pretty soon. And as I approach 50, it's like I put in a lot of time, energy, and effort. I've done all that stuff, the blood, sweat, and tears, the late nights, the all-nighters. I've done all that stuff, and I'm moving into a different part of my career. I'm not saying I'm Seth Godin, but I'm moving into a different part. I'm innovating in a different way so I can be smarter about how I work and how I sell my time. So is that the thing that you want? Because this is the thing that my wife and I debate about all the time. Because we know, given the pro community, given the products that we sell, given the speaking engagements that I have, I can actually make more money just working out of my house by myself, maybe with one assistant. But that's not what I'm interested in. So that's a lifestyle business where I go into cruise control. I probably do three to $400,000 of revenue a year by myself, have more in my pocket, have more time, can spend more time with my wife and kids. But that's not what I want right now. Because what I want is a much bigger mission, a bigger goal. And you know what that is. I don't need to get into that. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm like, I'm going to punt that a little bit further down the road. Right. I'm not ready to have a lifestyle business just yet. Well, and I also think, and I don't know if this is just me compartmentalizing things too, but I see my service or my services, they pay the bills. It allows me the flexibility to innovate on the side to potentially mm-hmm. build another business if that's what I want to also teach. Mm-hmm. And oh, so here we go. There's there's a specific reason why I would want that flexibility. It's not mm-hmm. just to coast, you know, make a nice cushy okay. amount, but it's actually to fuel other things that I would really would want to do fantastic you just walked into the hornet's nest or walked into the snare for the lion you just did it okay 
So right now, you're building one business to really create the business you, that you want to have. You're going to do the service brand strategy work so that you can work on the side extra hours to do the thing that you really love to do. So then the question is, and I know you're smiling because now you know where this is coming. And you now know why you stepped into the trap, which is, why aren't you just doing what it is that you want to do? What's holding you back from doing that? Why, how many careers do you want to have? How many arcs in your, in your, in your life, in your resume, in your LinkedIn profile do you want to write about? Oh, as many as I'm interested in. Really? Well, I think there's a number. Well, I okay. think as Well, let's the, talk about this. Uh, I don't know what that is. I want the flexibility to experiment and to try things. Mm -hmm. Because I don't, I don't have a specific thing I could tell you, oh, I want to build this type of business. I want it to be this big. I want to sell well, it. it. You know, there's not any. Let's do this. What? I'm scared. <laughs> you should be. <laughs> <laughs> I know right, let's you do too this. well. <laughs> let's do this. Let's do this. Uh, are you familiar with the Dan Sullivan question? The three-year question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to ask you your three-year question. I don't think I have an answer for that. You don't? Not well, Dan would fire you on the spot. One. You realize that. In his book, he's like, if you don't have an answer to it, I walk. You only get one chance to answer a question with Dan. So, Good thing you're not Dan. Here's the thing. is like I think oftentimes if we're looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we're looking at the bottom, which is food, shelter, clothing, that kind of stuff. And we're busy just dealing with the bottom parts. And we don't spend enough time thinking about the top parts where it's about self-fulfillment and, and self-awareness, those kinds of things, right? And why is that? Because we're just like busybodies. Maybe Seth is right. We've been trained to be obedient machines. And we say like, well, this is the model my parents taught me. This is the model society has told me to, to pursue. This is what I must be doing right now. But maybe instead of going on autopilot mode, we just need to pull that emergency brake and say, stop. Just take a moment. Take this Thanksgiving holiday and sit there and think, boy, what is it that I really want? If I can't see my future in three years... What am I doing? Because what happens is we put our blinders on. We look to the ground is why I'm looking down. And we don't know where we're going. We're just going. And then we look up and one day we're 40 and one day we're 50 and 70. And we, we're on our deathbed and we sit back and say, well, I could have done this. I should have done that. But I didn't. So this one life, this miracle of life that I was given, that I won the genetic lottery. And I threw it away. I have... I think I realized where the roadblock is for me. Okay, tell me, please. It's going to get deep. It's going to get deep. Yeah, so going go. back to the Seth Godin example. Mm -hmm. So when I hear you say, well, he built his business to X, X big, you know, sold it or, or whatnot, so that he can do this, that tells me, oh, so then I have to build my business to X, you know, however is big you, is to that then. What you heard? <laughs> <laughs> that's well that's what I'm hearing from yeah. what you had said that's mm. so that's just how I'm filtering the information that you had said mm -hmm. so then I think well because I heard Seth say I what did he say I make a living out of noticing things and yeah I love that I think that's why I love brand strategy so much is that I can make connections I can I can get information filter it and then make connections I love that. I think that's yes. one thing I love about brand strategy. So that I think is what I would want to do all the time, whether it's in brand strategy or whether it's just like Seth said, I make a living out of noticing things. Yeah. But then when you said, well, he built his business to so big before he's able to do that, then I think, well, then I guess I have to build my business to a certain point so that I can go do more of like the thought pieces. And does that that's give you a little fair. more perspective yeah yeah okay. i love that and I, I believe if people are watching this right they're gonna comment go melinda hashtag <laughs> show him what's up call him out on that nonsense and that's fantastic so let's talk about this i told you about i didn't tell you about seth i think initially you brought up seth and said he has a wonderful lifestyle business this is what he's doing and it's fine and it's not the one that you described chris he's not selling into the sunset but i said well no no no, no. you skipped over the first 30 years of his career we're only seeing what we want to see. And that's all I meant to say about that. Okay. Now I'm going to make some assumptions here. The opportunities that are present to you, everybody that's watching this here in 2018, are radically different than they were five years ago. 
completely different than they were 10 years ago and not even thinkable 30 years ago. So you have to live in the time that you're in. I have a theory based on zero information. I just want to like say that there's a big asterisk right here, right? Based on no information. But I, I can see in the patterns in the books that Seth has written, it's about marketing. He's deeply passionate about that. He wants to share that information with the world. So over his lifetime, he's written a lot of books, at least 18 bestsellers. So in the beginning, I think some of the ideas that he created were an offshoot of his passion. This is what I want to do with my life. It just so happened that somebody put a price tag on that of $30 million. He's like, fantastic. I'll sell it and I'll do this again. And it keeps evolving. It keeps changing. But what what the core of it is, I mean, his last book is called This is Marketing. Right? So eight, uh, however many years later, 18 books later or 19 books later, he's still talking about the same thing. Okay. Here's what Seth has done that I would encourage you to do. And you've heard me say this before. What you have to do is you have to be able to convert your knowledge and your experience into capital and equity. Now, currently, the way you convert is you sell it on a one-to-one -one basis. You meet an executive, you make a connection, and you sell your services, your time, essentially, hopefully for a very high price and probably higher every day, which is fantastic, right? But until you do something else with that, until you write a book, until you're vlogging or blogging, or speaking at seminars or putting together a video course, you're not able to sell your knowledge anywhere else except for a one-to-one -one relationship. Now, I know you have some products out there, and so you are doing that. So the question for you is, if you love noticing things for a living, how can you best optimize that? And I would build your business around that idea. So in three years from now, you're, you are where you're supposed to be. Now, one of the things is, and people see this, and I know it's a very conventional way of looking at it, and nothing wrong with that, okay? This is not for everybody. It's for the risk takers. It's for the entrepreneurs, the square pegs in the round hole. The troublemakers, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. If you're like, you know what? I want to do this. This is the safe path. And then when I do that, I'll do this. So each time you kind of move laterally. You're not quite starting over, but you're rebuilding each and every single time. Now, you could be looking at me like, you hypocrite, Chris. You hypocrite. You spent 20x years in the service business, and now you're here, and so it's easy for you to say. But I would say this to my son who's 12. This is the path you want to go down now. That's why I'm helping him learn how to speak, how to communicate, how to create content, how to take photographs, and how to talk about things and tell stories. Because I want him to be able to skip all that. To live in this time and not read the playbook from a generation or two generations ago. That's the key difference, right? You're still a relatively young woman. The, the world's ahead of you. So I want to encourage you to do the thing that really excites you. The thing that makes you jump out of bed every morning and say, Darn it, I can't wait to get started today. And then at night, when your body can't stay awake anymore, it tells you, time to go to sleep. That's when you stop. Now, Seth said something really interesting during our interview or conversation together. He said something about artists. When we're doing art, we say, how can I do more? And when we're doing work, we say, how can I do less? That's the difference between art and work. But it puts people into two categories, people who have jobs or people who are artists. And artist and that term is a title that I don't think a lot of people feel comfortable wearing. Like You may not consider yourself an artist. So I've been thinking about that a lot. I think the difference is how you see things. Do you see things as work or do you see things as play? And there are very smart people. I think Einstein said something very smart about play. So if you can create a life, design a life for yourself where you feel like you get to play, no matter how much you get paid, your life will have been well spent. So I want to help you design your life. So when we talk about this, somebody had asked me recently, like, Chris, what does it mean to be a business designer? How's that different than being a graphic designer, right? Because what we want to do is help businesses design to their potential. And then a life designer is the same thing. I want to help design your life to your potential and what you want. This has nothing to do with me. And if you don't want this, 
then I want to help you achieve whatever it is you want. But I heard it in you. So as soon as you said that, like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to get paid more so I can build a runway. And sooner than later, I think you'll start to realize something. It's like golden handcuffs. You've heard that term? Mm -hmm. Where the job or the thing you're doing pays so well, it's like you can't let it go because the money is so good. It becomes addictive. So if you actually achieve your goal, you'll sit there and say, well, why am I doing this other thing? Why am I grinding it out for 10 hours every night making $2? Why am I doing that? I'd rather just go to sleep and use those same 10 hours to make 20K. So I'm thinking here, there is a transition period between what you're doing now currently just to pay the bills and help support your life and your family. But there might be this other thing for you where you feel like every day it's like play. So what does that look like to you? Three years from now, if you get to play and make money, what does that look like? That looks like a couple of things. Mm -hmm. I think doing strategy still, but without any design. So purely making those connections with people one-on-one -on -one, uh, and then spending time analyzing and thinking about how all of those experiences that I've had, especially with brand strategy, how they relate, what problems have I seen over and over, then seeing connections amongst the broad experience that I've had. And then sharing that and sharing those insights that I've seen then from my own experiences. So if that's writing, if that's speaking. Um, so there's still an element of me working one-on-one -on -one with clients. And the other thing is collaborating with other creatives on pet projects. So similar to the Cat Hater Survival Kit, things right. like that where we can just think up something and we don't have a client, we're the client and we create, whether it's something like that where it's actually designed um, or maybe it's a business, I don't know, but working and collaborating with other creatives. Do you know the, the Knock Knock Company? No. Her name is Jen Billick, and she has OCD. She's clinically diagnosed with OCD, not like one of those, like, oh, I'm OCD, like a graphic designer, okay? And she created a company called Knock Knock, and it was basically uh, therapeutic for herself. It was organizational tools, so she would have notebooks and notepads and little stickers to remind her what to do, what not to do, to help her stay super organized in her life. And now she's built a fantastic business around that, so she took an obsession, a passion, uh, even uh, an illness, if you, if you look at it, and she was able to solve it for herself. And, and she realized she connected with so many other people. So she's, she has a whole line of products out there. You know, she has all kinds of wonderful things like the brain dump pad. So she's been able to create a whole business around this. And so when I hear you talking about making products and designing ideas to solve problems or things that you're passionate about, like the cat hater box, that could be your business. So you make connections of things that are missing in the marketplace where you're like, I love to do that. Why don't I just get together and start a Kickstarter project and make these things? That's Wouldn't that make you really happy? Works. Yes. No, no, I don't mean specifically just this one thing, but as as your business, as the core of what you do. See, uh, that yes, but I don't know how much I'd want to be involved past that. So past the initial idea, designing the prototype, Yes. I don't know if I'd really want to be involved then in running the business. Okay. There. So would you rather come up with the idea, design it, and sell the idea to somebody to make? Yeah. So every but, every problem yeah. you have has a solution. So you can conceptualize okay. products, and then you can go, and you can talk to one of our pro members, Seth, who basically does that. He licenses ideas to companies so that he doesn't have to deal with any of that, and he collects a royalty from every product that's sold. Yeah, I would be open to that. Oh, I'm sure you'd be open to that. <laughs> so you get to be to this dream maker, dream factory, and you get to just make wild idea products, and then you can have somebody like Seth even pitch it for you and just collect a royalty check. Wouldn't that get you up every single morning? Yes. And then when you have one or two hits, you can talk about the process and you can teach other people how to do that. I think that would be a pretty amazing life. I do like that. You see? So one of the other big shifts that we have to make is we have to move away from trying to solve other people people's problems to solving our own problems we can be our own client and that's the promise of the future you can do that too mm -hmm. okay we've taken a really meandering walk in the mind of melinda 
and you started out asking questions about journalists and strategists and what, how to position yourself maybe. Mm -hmm. And we've actually explored something much deeper. And how do you feel about that? How does that feel in your bones right now, what I just said to you? I feel excited. And it's definitely been something I've been thinking about and acting upon. It's definitely not something I've just put to the side. I think I do get stuck in the old, old way of thinking about, well, the business should look like this and right. it needs to be service-based and it needs to grow like this. And right. I'm just stuck in that. Mm -hmm. Not fully, you know, maybe 25% is solid in that mindset of, well, yeah. just get the clients and figure out where your target right. mar market is. And the other is playing and making things and, and or writing and making those connections and sharing um, the connections that I've realized or I've learned, especially through strategy. So I am doing those things and it's just a matter of shifting more of my weight or my attention to those. So yeah. it is exciting. This. Yeah. So do you feel like you're kind of inside the bottle? Yeah, I feel like I'm <laughs> kind of on the edge. Like I'm kind of, see, I can kind of see the label can, a little how, bit. How can you see the label? You cannot see the label from inside the bottle. I think I can. I'm holding out that bottle. I'm like, Melinda, <laughs> there's this thing that you want to do that makes you really happy. And you just told me that. I didn't tell you that. And I'm like, oh, from the outside, what you described to me is this. So, guys, we just got super meta here. We were using Melinda's own analogy for her, against her, with her, that she used to say, like, okay, I come into an organization as an outsider. I have this fresh and objective perspective. I help them understand who they are and what they need to do with their business, and I'm able to provide this as an insight to them as a company. For that, I'd like to get paid a lot of money. So if you're watching this episode, you may have just seen it happen in real life, unscripted in real time and that's kind of what a strategist does or a therapist you know i'm hearing a lot of different things and melinda's like how do i do this so she's coming at me with self-diagnosed and self-prescribed solutions and she's like well help me figure this part out chris so all i have to do is ask her a series of questions allow her to speak and listen and notice things notice things for a living and how am I going to, this is going to get super, super meta, how am I going to make money on this? Well, guess what? I'm sharing my knowledge and experience and I'm converting that into video format for you guys to see. So each and every single person who sees this, I'm able to build equity in that. Not necessarily on a one-to-one -one ratio where everybody that watches, I make a dollar. That would be nice, but that's okay. So if Melinda and I were having this conversation privately, I've exchanged my time for a finite return. But now we're doing it publicly and now you guys get to benefit from that. Okay, I think that's it for this episode. I'm gonna wrap it up right here. Melinda, it's always good to see you. And this, I believe, is the beginning of a new series where you and I will have these kind of conversations. When we chatted, we said, what's the problem of, of getting you to, to be a regular guest on our show? And you're like, I don't have time. And really, you don't because the drive from Orange County to Santa Monica is murder. It's like an hour and 45 minutes without traffic. And then to go back again with traffic would just destroy your day. So I get that to come in and record for a one hour's worth of content. It doesn't make sense. So let's use technology. Let's solve the problem. Like what's holding you back? Well, it's the commute. Dude, it's killing me. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to continue the series. Guys, please let us know what you think of this episode. Go ahead and give it a like, comment, and subscribe. Did, did I give Melinda good advice? What would you do in her situation? What other questions can we ask them so they, they can comment down below, Melinda? Uh, what what is their three year plan? Oh that oh good one. Okay, so you guys let us know what your three year plan is. And the Dan Sullivan question goes something like this. Okay, three years from now, if you and I are having this conversation, looking back on those three years, what has happened for you to be so happy, both professionally and personally in your life? That's the Dan Sullivan question. So guys, think about that for a little bit, and have a plan towards your three year goal. It's a perfect question. It's a Dan Sullivan question. And I want to thank you guys for tuning in. I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.